My name is Dawn Dole and I'm the executive director for the Taos Institute. These Dialogue with the Author series are hosted by the Taos Institute as a free offering um, to just let people know about new books that are coming out and we're really excited about our call this morning. <clears throat> The Taos Institute is a nonprofit educational organization, and um, our mission is to bring together scholars and practitioners that are concerned with um, the social processes, the how we create the world we want to live in. So through social construction, which is the theoretical basis for our work, through social construction, you know, how do we look at reason, knowledge, human value? Um, and looking at that through practices of relational practice, collaborative and appreciative practices around the world. So we bring people together from really all over the world. We've got um, people that join in from usually 50 different countries at, at various times, depending on our program and, and what we're doing, what we're working on. And so um, as you introduce yourself in the chat, make sure you tell us where you're from, um, and then again, one thing that drew you to this call, this is a brand new book and uh, we're gonna be introducing it in a minute. Um, but I also wanted to let you know, these dialogue with the author series happen about once a month and they are a free offering. Um, we do try to make some of our programs free. Uh, we also have programs that there's a small fee, uh, some of our online workshops and seminars and conferences. Uh, but when we can offer them free, we like to do that. So I also want to invite you to think about making a donation to the Taos Institute as a nonprofit because we are funded through donations and our program fees. If you feel so moved to make a donation, I will put that link in the chat for you. Um, and we just wanna welcome everybody. These are really exciting times to be together when, when a new book is, is coming out. And we're just so grateful that you're here um, to learn with us, talk and be in collaboration on these ideas. So I'm gonna turn it over to Alex Arnold, who is our uh, program director, and she's gonna introduce herself and then the book. Hi, thank you, Don. Welcome, everyone. It's so exciting to see such a large group uh, today for this dialogue. Um, so as Don mentioned, this is a, a series. We offer one every month, and, and we're very thrilled to have today Hasan Moon and her new book, Coaching A to Z, The Extraordinary Use of Ordinary Words. And the book is launching in March, so you, we are very lucky to have this, this pre um preview of it and welcome Hesun. I'm going to let you introduce yourself and enjoy yourselves everyone. Oh dear hello wow um so good to see so many of you oh uh did you spotlight me I want to see everyone else let me see let me just change the gallery view <laughs> there you go ah there you are well so good to see so many of you. I'm so excited and uh, it, it's it's funny that I say this I'm extremely nervous for some reason I think, you know, when I teach and stuff like that, I'm usually okay, but for some reason, I'm slightly nervous, so hopefully it's okay. And welcome to uh, this conversation, and it's called Dialogue with the Author, so my hope is that we can actually converse about it, and also, I mean, you might actually converse with other people. Hopefully, you're okay with that. I mean, do you, do, are you okay with people? Like, it's a whole relational thing that we do, so hopefully it's Okay. But I know that some of you are joining from some uh, uh, some other places where it might be 11 o'clock p.m., I think someone said in the chat, or if it's uh, early in the morning, please don't worry about you know joining in with your video on. You can just uh, put in the chat and so on. So hopefully that's okay. So good to see many familiar faces that I miss. And uh, thank you for joining. I wanted to tell you a story that just happened in my house, by the way. Um, oh, before that, I think I need to introduce myself, Alex. Is that how it goes? So I'm from Toronto. And uh, what do I do? I do stuff related to coaching, related pra uh, relational practices and things like that. But mostly I feel like I am so busy with my two dogs. I have a um, four-year-old dog. It's a terrier. And I have a four-month-old 
uh, which is, I don't know what, what she is anymore, but she actually looked like a little poodle, but then she's now becoming, she looks a little bit different now, so I don't know what she is. Anyway, I have two dogs and I, I actually told my mom, you know, if I knew that having a puppy would be this much of a work, then I would have just had a baby instead. And then she's like, yeah, I don't know if it works like that. Anyway, <laughs> so I'm busy with the two dogs. Um, and also I'm in the middle of actually sending my nephews who are living with me back to school in person. And uh, so the whole household is just complete chaos and I actually enjoy it. It's not bad. So that's what's happening. So just a couple of days ago, we're having dinner and we're just having this conversation. I was sitting down with my nephew, Nathan, and we we're having dinner and just conversation was about, so Nathan, what do you think machines can do that humans can't? And we were just chatting about it. And then I also says, what do you think that humans can do that machines can't? So we were chatting and then Nathan said, um, can you hack humans? Like, can humans be hacked? And I thought, that's a very interesting concept. And I, I, and I don't know a lot, of, uh, a lot of hacking and stuff, but he's into it. So then I said, Nathan, what do you mean by hacking? Like, wh what does that mean? And he actually said, well, hacking is kind of like you run different script." And I thought, oh my gosh, yes, I think humans can be hacked. And I said, so what else do hackers do? And he's like, well, you know, it hijacks your memory and, you know, it runs a different script. And I'm thinking, I didn't know until that point that coaching actually is hacking. <laughs> so anyway, I'm telling you about this book that I wrote. Apparently it's about hacking. And I, I hope that this is actually useful to you. And really, as after that conversation, I was reading parts of the book again. Oh, by the way, let me show you, because I'm holding it in my hand. That's the book with a little potato. I'll tell you about it in a bit. So I was actually you know, reading it with this new lens of a hacking. <laughs> and I realized we actually do some hacking in conversations, especially in coaching, because we are assisting other people to run different script. And I'm still thinking about that whole idea of hacking, human hacking, relational hacking. Anyway, I wanted to do this uh, conversation about the book. And this is my very first time actually talking about my book. Very first time. And I wanted to do, do it actually at Taos because Taos Institute is where I feel at home. So this is my home. So I wanted to actually do it through Taos first. So thank you for showing up. and. Maybe I can tell you how this book came about. I don't know if you can uh, relate to this, but my parents were wondering what I actually do. <laughs> so, you know, I go out and travel around the world and teach, but then they're like, what do you really do? So I tell them, they're like, oh, that doesn't make any sense. Then, then, you know, they keep asking, what do you do? What do you do? So then I actually, one day I got a book that's, uh, you know, solution focus, brief coaching translated to Korean. I said, here, this is what I do. I give it to them, read it. And my dad actually read that cover to cover. And he said, I still don't understand what you do. <laughs> so what do you actually do? So then I thought, my goodness, there must be a way to actually talk about my work in a simpler terms. So then I actually then gave him examples. So I said, dad, it's kind of like this. When you're talking to people, there are different ways of actually talking to people. And one example I told him was, if somebody says on a scale of one to 10, and they say, my life is at seven, what would you say, dad? And he said, well, you say, well, seven is not good enough. So what are you going to do to actually move up on the scale? He, he said, I said, exactly. That's what people will do, thinking that's motivating. So you think, you know, pushing people on, you know, up on the scale is motivating. And then he's like, what's wrong with that? I asked that there's nothing wrong with it. But what if instead of actually saying, hey, you are at a seven and how like you're already at a seven rather than you're almost at a 10. There's a huge gap between you're almost, you're almost at a 10 versus you're already at a seven. And then he's like, oh, good point, good point. <laughs> and then I said, dad, you think seven is not good enough. 
And he said, well, seven is not really good enough. I mean, you have to be at least at nine. And then I said, how come not at 10? And he said, because no one is perfect. <laughs> so anyway, we were having that conversation and that's what actually triggered this book. Are there some simple sort of words that we use that are like really simple, that it's ordinary, but we use in a very specific way that can really hack the conversation. And what's really amazing about words that we use is it cues different script. It doesn't cause them, but it cues different script. So I thought I'm gonna write a book that's easy enough for my parents to read and uh, they will be able to actually get what I actually do. So that's how it started about five years ago. And then a lot of things happen in between uh, my life, including uh, my dad being diagnosed with a cancer and passing away and all those things. So it was on hold, but not really, but uh, it finished. And it's so meaningful because I think writing this or re coming back to finish the book is what actually um, helped me through the grieving process. So it was so uh, meaningful to me. And for that reason, I actually put in a couple chapters in there, remembering my, my you know, conversation with my dad. And first chapter is A, which is already. And then also G is good enough. Because <laughs> he actually talked about, is that good enough? And how do we really have the sense of actually good enough in our conversation so that people will actually feel that they're actually good enough after they leave your conversation? Do they feel good enough or they are not good enough? Anyway, so that's that's sort of like background of this book. And also um, maybe another story that I can tell you about the book is on the cover, um, I put this little, I don't know if you can see it. It's a little potato. <laughs> you see the potato? And it's more like an inside joke. Many of you know this, why we actually put potato, potatoes if you're in dialogic, you know, relational work. Potato actually means something. So how conversation happens, not, conversation may not grow like a tree, but conversations usually grow out like potatoes. <laughs> so I thought, I just have to put this potato there. But the funny thing is when I actually show this design to my mom, she says something so weird that I still don't know what she means by that. I, I showed it to her. Look at this potato again, please. And then she said, that's so cute. Is it because you're Asian? I have no idea why she said that. So anyway, that's the cover. So really the book is about how do we curate people's stories with different cues using ordinary words, um, A to Z really. It's literally from A to Z. So A is already and so on. And one, uh, one little struggle that I had, obviously, as you might think, is the letter X. <laughs> so there are not a lot of words in English that actually starts with an X that we ordinarily use in coaching conversation. Could you please, Pick a guess what I had to choose in the chat box. What do you think the letter X will spell out? So I had to play a little trick here. What do you think? Anton says, exception, experiment. Hey, oh, X-ray. Wow, xylophone. Wouldn't that be fun though? And so really, Dwayne, in what ways would you use xylophone in your ordinary conversation? <laughs> uh, so this one was the toughest one uh, for a different reason. So going back to the scaling. So usually in our conversation with our clients, uh, we may use things like scaling and scale of one to 10. And then they will actually say, well, I'm at a seven or I'm at an eight. And as Jonah says, what is that X? Whatever the number is on that scale, what is that X on the scale? So actually the chapter X is a slightly different that it's X on a scale because we actually use that in coaching conversation. And that's the chapter I'm going to actually share with you uh, later on that uh, it's about 
when somebody says I am here, wherever that is on the scale, X on a scale, how do we actually go about having a conversation about their progress that they have already made rather than it's not good enough <laughs> to push you up, push you up on the scale. So that's the whole chapter with a story with my dad, actually. So let me tell you about that story before I invite you to talk to one another in small groups. So Exxon uh, on a scale uh, chapter has, so each chapter actually has two stories, one from my childhood, my personal life, and then uh, another story from actual coaching conversation. And Exxon a scale um, is how do we use scale as a metaphor of person's growth and progress? And the story that's in that chapter is renovating a house. So I don't know how many of you actually have done that. And I don't know why we would do that, but we do this thing. I, I know some of you actually have your, put your hand up. When you renovate a house, we always start with something like our own plan. That's going to take what? Two weeks. This is like four week project. <laughs> Before you know, it becomes four months. And for me, I thought it's just a little washroom that we're gonna actually bathroom that we're gonna renovate. Turned out to be three, like it's three months later, we're still doing it. So story is about renovating a bathroom and taking down all these things. And then as we were, my, my dad and I and my brother, we were actually renovating a house, stripping off the wallpaper. And we found some markings on the wall when we stripped off the wallpaper. And the markings were so weird. First marking we actually saw, and it was not renovated since 19, probably 60s or 70s. Because when we took the mirror out, the back of the mirror, there's a little stamp that says West Germany. I'm like, ooh, this actually dates back some time. <laughs> so then we're looking at this writings, writings on the wall. And one said Jim R. It was somebody's signature with a date on it, 1963. And I'm thinking, this is kind of creepy, what is this? And then we actually then took off another strip of wallpaper and there were like lines and then Terry with a date on it. And there's another one, line on it, the name and the date. And we were like, what is this? And then my dad realized, oh my goodness, this is a growth chart. So Jim probably was the father who was like, you know, measuring their kids, actually their height as they're growing up. And I remember that moment, my dad actually took up his gloves and he just, you know, went down on the floor and he was just touching that markings. And he's like, oh, it's, it was their kids. And what was so amazing about that moment was that's when I actually learned when we use scaling, it's kind of like a growth chart. Sometimes we actually, I mean, you will never use your growth chart with your kids and say, by next year, here's a marking that you should grow to. I mean, we don't do that. <laughs> like, that would be really absurd if you did that. So you are 15 right now, by 16, you should be at this height and, and mark it. We don't do that, but somehow we do that in our coaching conversations. We say, well, you should be really there instead of actually celebrating the growth that they actually have done so far. So for example, that's a story in that chapter. I hope that you really enjoy uh, those couple stories in each of the chapters. So um, I don't know. So that's a little bit of background of the book. And I have a couple exercises for you from the book because it also it has reflection guides and stuff like that. Would you be okay to try something? Yeah, is that okay? So I have a couple things for you. One is um, I have a quote that I want to share with you. So first one is I'm going to share this quote with you. And in your groups, kind of think about or talk about what kind of what this means to you, what, what this does for you today. Wherever you are right now, you might be in the middle of different changes, whatever that might be. But I put this quote, this happens to be one of my favorite quotes from the book. So if you can sort of talk about it for maybe five, six minutes and then come back and we're going to do sort of the second part and then continue on. Anyway, really so good to see you. I'm going to put this in the chat box so that you can all see this quote, by the way, so you can have it with you. And it's a short one. And there you go. Now it's in the chat box. 
So breakout rooms, Alex, would you be able to put people, maybe four people in each room for maybe next seven minutes? By the way, um, I also need to introduce this book, one of my favorite books from the past. It's called by John Orberg called Everyone is Normal Until You Get to Know Them. So as you're in this small groups, people might look normal, <laughs> but know that, uh, you know, once you get to know them, there's no such thing as normal. So really enjoy getting to know each other. And hopefully you will be able to join in by chat <clears throat> or, you know, with your audio and so on. Okay. So code actually is, uh, in case you cannot see it, it's in the chat box. Uh, I'll read it out for you. It says dreams and dreads are similar in their magnitude just different in their frequency. And in case you can't see it, I'm gonna read it one more time. Dreams and dreads are similar in their magnitude, <clears throat> just different in their frequency. Okay, just a quick chat, getting to know each other, saying hi, and then just talking about this quote and what this might actually mean for you. Not bad, eh, people? Just meeting people there, were they bearable? Were they okay? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Some of you are like, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> oh man, that's... So I actually had one very interesting thought as I was reading the book that I actually have written. And then I was surprised at how many parts that I actually have forgotten about. And then I thought, because now they're thinking about actually translating. And I thought, oh man, how is it going to translate? Because this is written in English from A to Z. But then if you, let's say, if you were to actually translate uh, one of the word here, S is for suppose. Now then, if you were to translate this to just another language, it's not going to start with an S. <laughs> so it actually just, everything just goes, pff. so I'm, I'm so conflicted about it. And also another curiosity is, this is actually written in English with English words, with English meanings and how it's English use, then I thought, how would that actually translate? Not only in its meaning, but in its use. So let's say if we actually translate to like very like, let's say Spanish, French, I mean, French is second language here, <laughs> but it's going to be, it's not going to be A to Z. <laughs> so I thought, how would that work? And second, so that was a practical thing, but second one is in English, when I talk about, oh, you're already here, or you're almost there, but then would it actually have the similar uh, tone in different language? So that's something that I was really curious about because many of you speak other languages. I mean, I speak Korean. And when I look at this and I'm like, can I translate to Korean? And it, all, like, it already sounds so weird when I translate this. So I wanted to also hear from many of you for your reflection too, because I see people who probably may speak, maybe English is a min like minority language here <laughs> in this group actually. So what do you think? What are some of your uh, thoughts about that? Uh, Paul says it will be okay in Dutch. Suppose could be okay. Hey, that actually is, S is okay. <laughs> but then some other words, right? And uh, Thomas says, there are some books that needs to be read in the original language. And, and the way that I actually have written, my um, sort of final editing was done by giving this book to my nephew to read. He's 12. And if he could read, I thought, okay, this will be easy enough for people who you know, speak English as their additional language. And then he didn't have a lot of trouble, actually. He actually pointed out a few words and he's like, uh, can you fix that? Can you fix that? <laughs> but then one thing that he, I was really surprised by is that he didn't have any trouble with the whole framework that I introduced in this book. So that's something that I'm going to tell you about, uh, if that's okay. There's a framework that I use in coaching and the whole book is designed around that framework. And some of you might know this framework, but in case you don't, uh, let me take about, is it okay if I take up maybe seven, eight minutes to tell you about it? I mean, you're here, so hopefully that's what you're here for. So I'm going to use um, whiteboard. Uh, do, I, do I have, how do I do that? Oh, there you go. 
And this framework has gone around and come back with a lot more questions than I designed it to be. And also this framework was uh, designed with many other people's work in the background. So this did not come out of like isolation. So the framework is a very simple one. <clears throat> and <clears throat> excuse me, and you have that in your chapter that you have received actually when you registered. And the framework is simply a listening compass. And many times when we talk about coaching, people think it's about what questions do we ask? <laughs> and I was really bothered by that idea of um, the pursuit of good questions. And it's actually pretty absurd if you think about it, because you can ask me a really good question, whatever that might mean. But if I actually give you an answer that's slightly out of what you expect, then that's going to break down the sequence. For example, when people ask me, how are you? I know I'm supposed to say I'm fine, thank you, and you, but I don't follow the script. <laughs> so when people say, how are you? I say stuff like, I'm just okay. <laughs> and then people don't know what to do with it. They're like, just okay? <laughs> and I say, yeah, I'm just okay. By the way, that's another word, J, just is the word in the book. And they, they are so confused. It's like, why are you not, they're almost offended that I'm not actually following the whole script, the cultural script of you're supposed to say, I'm fine, thank you, and you. So there's no such thing as a good question, especially if you're working in uh, solution-focused coaching. That was one of the biggest mistakes that we were overselling questions as the thing. So in uh, maybe in resistance of that, uh, what actually happens is coaching actually begins and ends with listening not questioning. So here's a listening compass. When your client comes in to talk with you and they sit down with you, that's your client. Uh, and that's not a skirt. It's just, you know what I mean? So they sit down with you in this space. We, we are going to actually call it now. So you are having this conversation and while the conversation of coaching, therapy, whatever it might be, this is defined as now. And then they tell you a story about what happened, how they lived their life, ups and downs of their life. And then they also talk about what their life is going to be. So there's a very clear timeline in people's narratives. So, you know, once we actually define the time that we have together as now, this is their past and this is their future. And this is really easy to do when you are uh, watching a videotape or when you're reading a transcript, you can see it very clearly that people have uh, especially, I guess, I cannot say clearly because English has clear tense, like past tense, future tense, right? But then some of the language may not have that, so it may not be that clear. And then also what they do is they will talk about something that they want, they want and something that they don't want. Now, this framing is a little bit different than what's kind of popular out there in the coaching world where people say, oh, Positive, happiness, well, that's not, let's not assume that's what people want. I mean, for example, one huge lesson I learned going through the grieving process of losing my dad was I didn't want to be happy. That's not what I wanted. I would be offended if somebody was actually trying to get me out of my grieving. So simply this end over here is something that they want more of, the plus for more. And then here is something that people say that they want less in their life. So it's a very simple framework of how you listen. We listen differently. As you sit down with the people and listening to people, these are roughly, you can actually place where they are, uh, where they are in their conversation on this map. So area number one is what we say, something that they talk about that they want more in the future. And I guess a popular term in solution-focused coaching is called preferred future. And it's, it's in the chapter there, you will see it. And second one here is something that they really liked from their past that they would love to see more of or that they enjoyed experiences, thoughts, interactions called resourceful past. See, that's why my nephew was having such a hard time because I'm using this language and they're like, I don't understand this. <laughs> so then third area over here is something that they didn't enjoy. 
uh, could be as light as just a simple trouble, or it could be uh, trauma, small t, big t trauma people go through. Uh, I see small t trauma and also big t trauma because uh, one of the things that I realize is that uh, there, it's just being human is sometimes inherently traumatic, <laughs> I guess. So that's what I mean by small t trauma, maybe. So something that you didn't like from the past, troubled past, traumatic past. And then four is it's so funny that I talk about trauma, you know, with, with a smile and laughing. And the fourth area is something in the future that you would not like to see happen, which is dreaded future. You just talked about dreams and dread. It's similar in magnitude, just different in their frequency. And this is where that idea comes from. This may be your dream. This is your dread. They actually both hold something very powerful, but maybe it's a different frequency. This is called dreaded future. And now one big confusion in when I actually teach this is people will take this and then they're like, okay, so what questions do we ask in each quadrant? <laughs> and they just turn it into a questioning model where this is intended and it really should be, it should remain as a listening model. So it's not about what you do, it's about what clients say. So then how do we really remain in this listening space? And then I think a really interesting thing, interesting thing happens when you look at this map, a lot of times, how do we actually stay in a position to really acknowledge people's uh, troubled past and dreaded future, but not exploring, but acknowledging it and also then moving, maybe if it's useful, creating this movement upward. So this movement upward will be actually called resource activation. And, and there are a lot of things that we think that we do, but this book was written with very simple cues to create this movement of resource activating. So one example is, well, I am so fearful of my future. Like, I don't know, I'm, I feel so stuck. Then you say, well, you must actually have thought about this a lot. So what's already becoming clearer for you? Now the word already is a little cue that not a cause, but a cue <laughs> to really shift the conversation a bit. After, after acknowledging it's, it's, it's not easy and what's already clearer for you and what's, what have you already thought about? And those are some examples of ordinary words that we have. So that's a simple framework called, um, what is it called now? Dialogic orientation quadrant. It's a quadrant and the function is to orient the conversation. And then it happens in a dialogue. So that's why it's dialogic orientation quadrant. So, you know, I'm going to actually pause here and then uh, check in with you if, to see if you have questions. What questions do you have or comments? <laughs> ah. What do you think? Well, um... I was thinking, and it's a question I brought from the beginning because I read the introduction you sent, that again, I think it's cultural context that mm -hmm. life doesn't happen in quadrants because <laughs> life doesn't happen in, right. in straight lines. Yes. You, you may be, and, and it's a little bit of what, what uh, Ken talks about different identities. As a professor, I can be in this quadrant, but as an aunt to my niece, I can be here, but as an aunt to my nephew, I can be here. So it's yes. more like, goes like this. <laughs> so for me, was like, this doesn't make sense to me. Uh -huh. But but maybe is because, like, for example, in Kananki, we talk a lot about having ants, you know, the, the ants, the little bug conversation, mm -hmm. because ants do not walk in 
it lands. <laughs> At the end. Yeah. We have a lot of ants here because tropical, you know. <laughs> so or me that goes like this and comes back and returns and goes up and down looking for a place to go. And sometimes they stop to, to pick up a little crumb of bread that you didn't realize came out of mm -hmm. your table during breakfast. And, 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 and they don't seem to be able to move it by themselves because they are so small. So suddenly there are other ants that come and they start moving this small crumb yes. towards their nest or whatever. But it's not a straight line. So, so that's why my question is, how did you come with these straight lines and quadrants? Because oh, they don't make that. sense to me. <laughs> I love that so much because Papusa, what actually before it became straight line and actually was a squig squiggly line. And then actually before that it was a loop. <laughs> so yes, and I think it's a straight line for illustration purposes. It's a heuristic, so it's easy. And when I actually did my entire research using this, I realized, oh, I can't really map everything on this. What do I do? <laughs> so then there are a lot of X factors. The small crumbs, as you talk about, it may look small now, but it may grow. It may grow something big. And it happens in conversations. You don't know when it's going to happen. It just shows up and you don't know when it shows up. Because that little insignificant thing is not small anymore, like two utterances later. And that's the beauty of like, I, when I actually look at the quadrant, something that we, I put it out as, okay, it doesn't fit here. And then two utterances later, it became a thing. It's like, how did it come about? So using the quadrant actually as a way to sort of like just follow around the trail, that's what was really exciting for me. I really don't, I hope that you don't fit everything that's happening in your life into the quadrant, but it's a, uh, it's a model. So hopefully it's, it's not the territory itself. <laughs> so hopefully that's, thank you so much. I, I feel so validated. It used to be a squiggle and loop and all those things. Yes. It was a spiral at one point, by the way. <laughs> thank you, Krista. Well, first of all, bring out a quote from George Box. He said, all models lie, some are useful. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, but, then there you go. So I know that you're using the well, that personal dialogic tool, which is awesome. However, I work with uh, safety managers and engineers helping to transform organizations. And I see this having a great uh, assistance to them. Because what we see is that they tend to get stuck in their troubled past, especially when they focus on accidents and negative events. And they have a really hard time moving forward. Mm -hmm. They have a hard time seeing their future. They can project mm -hmm. it, but they, they, it, it's, it is truly a dream that doesn't acknowledge that troubled past. Mm -hmm. And so I, I can see where this might actually, uh, I'll have to think on this and see how I might be able to fit in some of this language to help them move forward, because that's mm -hmm. what I, I try to do. Oh, Krista, I love that you say, how do you actually bring their language forward? And that's the whole intention behind it. You know, things happen when we add our stuff in there, our own logic in the dialogic interaction with other people. Because we bring our logic too, which is very useful at times. And then I think things happen when clients say something and then we change it up or we add our own stuff. A lot of different things happen. Sometimes usefully, sometimes really dreadfully. <laughs> so I love that you say how do we bring their language forward? Thank you so much for saying that. Wow. Thank you. Huh. Thank you. Hey, other thoughts, other questions before we do the next little bit? Michael says, who's a quote from? Which quote, Michael? The Dream and Dread? Yes. Uh, which book do you think that's in? Like, hello? <laughs> we, we were just curious in our group. We were wondering, and we, we, I kind of assumed it was yours. So thanks for humoring me, Hasan. Hey, there Love you it. go. 
Oh, it was actually um, easy and very difficult to write a book without using references. So it was, uh, it was quite interesting. Hey, other thoughts, what do you think? Other questions, other thoughts, maybe about the framework, maybe about the book. Uh, you know, Mary, I think you're on mute. Are you, are you speaking or? Oh, there you go. Where did she go? Oh, I don't see her. Okay. Oh, well, then there you go. Um, <clears throat> chapter, someone asked me uh, just last week, which chapter was the most difficult to write? <laughs> <laughs> oh, let me actually tell you a few other words so that you can actually start using it in your conversations, by the way. Is that okay? So yeah. if you can don't you get the, book, the whiteboard again. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, whiteboard. Yes, Mary. You're Thank back. You. Wonderful. Ooh, if I put it, put the whiteboard up, then does the one that we were using show up or no? Yes, it does. There you go. Thank Do you, you see it, Mary? Yes, I can. Okay. You have a, you have a question about this? No, I just wanted to record it. Oh, okay. Oh, you're going to get the recording and the chapter too. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, of course. There you go. So um, some words that I used here is A is for already. And then other words that maybe uh, will be very useful is D. What do you think D is? Let's play this game. What do you think the D English D word might be that we use ordinarily in coaching conversation that can cue that shift? Karen says dreams, decide, desire. I love your you know, responses because it shows a lot about also uh, your assumptions about coaching practice, doesn't it? <laughs> love it. Uh, and all those things, you know what? Maybe you should write a chapter about this, okay? With your word. But the word that I chose actually is difference. Because sometimes when we say, suppose, you know, somehow the things that you wanted to see happen is happening, what difference would that make for you? So the D word actually happens to be difference. And I think this is so ordinary that people don't even know that you're using it to cue a different script so that you're hacking the conversation. But anyway, that's one. Another one that I really think is useful is the I word. It starts with an I. And it's so useful, especially when you are actually shifting, when you're acknowledging and shifting from what they don't want to what they want. And Karen says, important. Imagine, and Emma says, instead, and that's what I wrote about. So when people are telling a lot about something that they don't want, so clearly you are clear about what you don't want. So what is that you want instead? Without assuming that, so since you don't want this, you must want this. Well, that's not your job to do. <laughs> it's actually asking the clients, what is that you want instead? So I, I chose instead for that, but seriously, this is kind of fun to think about. If you were to write your own version of something like this, what words would you choose for each letter of your own alphabet? And that's Ignite. something that, I, huh, Mary? Ignite. Ignite, right? It's not fun. And then uh, what else is there? Maybe I'll give you a couple more because I think it's so useful to actually use them. And then, uh, oh, so S is for suppose. So simply you're not, especially when we're coaching and using in dialogic ways, we are not imposing, but a lot of coaches, they impose their assumptions and their suggestions. <laughs> but how do we suppose instead of impose or even propose? We are supposing, simply supposing that whatever you say you would like to see is happening, then what would be different? So S is for suppose. And then here's the last one, maybe last two, so you can actually um, play with it. What do you think I chose for the Y word? This is our, our own word all we're playing. <laughs> it's a three letter word starting with a Y. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Some of you say you. And this is something that I learned from my nephews, actually, because um, 
my older nephew has this tendency to answer my every question with, I don't know, or sometimes even abbreviated, uh, okay? So he answered me like that. Then my little nephew actually the other day added, I don't know yet, he said, because he was being defensive about something. And then he's like, well, I don't know that yet. As if like, did you know that when you're my age? So anyway, the word is yet. And yet actually has a lot of um, anticipation for growth and, 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 and things like that in the word. So you're not there yet, okay. And, and you don't know yet, okay. <laughs> That's different than you don't know this. And then the last one is this. Well, um, it's a four letter word starting with a Z or Z for those of you who say it like that in a weird way, Z. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> what do you think the four letter word is? Wordle, I, have you not been playing? You should know this, it starts with a Z. It's a green box, Z. <laughs> Zone, Zoom, hello, this is so cool, Zest. This is so neat. Hey, Anton, zombie is six letter. What are you doing? Here? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and actually, let me read a little quote uh, in front of zero. The word is zero. Yeah. Especially if you're using the scaling from zero to 10. And zero is focusing on the presence of possibilities, not absence of progress even at the lowest point on a scale. Mm-hmm. So Z is for zero. And I actually have one last little uh, activity for you. I hope it's okay. Do you want to do that? Yeah. Yeah. You want to you wanna do conversation? Is it okay? Mm-hmm. And I'm going to put it in the chat and uh, just play with it. And then after you come back, actually, you know, I'm going to read you just one section from the book, which happens to be my favorite page. So let me see if I can actually put this in the chat and hopefully you can see this. Okay. And there, there's a chapter on uh, the reflection guide on yet. So hopefully you can download it from there. Okay. And then have a conversation about uh, this. And then Nin says, is the book out now? Um, Before you go into the breakout rooms, uh, I wrote this book actually as a gift to my parents. And um, the book is being released on March 8th. That's my dad's birthday. (laughs) That would have been his um, 81st birthday which will be a very special birthday by the way and um yeah so it's already available but it's not released until my dad's birthday so thank you so much for asking actually and it's my gift to my parents so you know what actually why don't we all stay if that's okay and you actually have the activity there so maybe you can use it uh, with other people in your life instead of actually going off and then also um, emma i'm gonna send you a separate one maybe and we can probably, you know, share this actually as a separate uh, attachment as well. When you, um, let me actually put this in the chat. When we send out the uh, the recording, but I wanted to um, kind of tell you about maybe before you actually log log out. Um, let me invite somebody that I want to have here before I read this for you. My mom is home, <laughs> so I'm gonna actually invite my mom. Is it okay? By the way, there's a difference between I live with my mom and my mom lives with me. You know the big gap between those two sentences? <laughs> so after my uh, dad passed, uh, my nephews are here, I'm here, and then we all, and it's pandemic happened and we're all together. So it's been such a blessing in a way that I was able to read, you know, write this book. And here's what happened when, when uh, the book was delivered, actually, 
we were not expecting the book uh, to be delivered at my door until like another like two, three weeks. So then we had this box with no name on it and we didn't know what it was. So we actually opened it. And then it was the book. And as soon as my mom realized it was the book, she grabbed the copy from my hand. And I was like, what are you doing? And she just put her hand on the book and she just started to pray. And I got to actually hear my mom pray for the book. And her prayer was, whoever is reading this book, let this book bear much fruit in their heart. So that was her prayer. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> That's my mom. Ah, there you go. So you know what? Let me actually read you this page as my mom is here. And this actually, my favorite page is the dedication page. And the dedication, it says, for mom, you gave my heart a sight and my mind a sound. This is my gift for you in profound gratitude and love. And then also for my, my dad, Oh, this is the best part, really. And for dad, your story, our story, and now my story. I inconsolably miss you as I imagine you holding this book. So that's my favorite page of the book, of the book dedication. So, you know, with that, I really would love to actually invite you to <laughs> really just have a conversation that's blessing to other people. And I'm going to actually put you in small groups so that you can have that conversation with other people. But I wanted to introduce my mom. <laughs> this is my mom. And this is everyone. Let me actually see, make sure that my mom can see all of you. There you go. For those of you who actually watch Squid Game, you know what 안녕하세요 means, right? It means hello in Korean. <laughs> ah. 반갑습니다. Uh, 반갑습니다 means nice to meet you. So there you go. <laughs> Let me translate that for you. So in your small groups, would you please have this kind of heartfelt conversation? We're going to put you in maybe a larger groups, four people, and not everyone needs to share. But could you please share a thought or two, especially if you want to use a reflection guide, please go ahead and do that. But have some conversation. Yeah, maybe 10 minutes or so. Mm. <laughs> and this is actually a reflection guide for the chapter yet. And the word yet creates room for ante anticipation. And you are considering one or two or more of these questions in your conversation, whichever one that you resonate with, you can actually answer. And first question is, what are some of your examples of what is yet to come? Second question is, what have you always wanted to learn that you have not learned yet? By the way, I signed up for biochemistry for this reason. And <laughs> question number three, Think of someone you've known for a very long time that you care about. What hopes do you have for them that they may not have for themselves yet? You see the keyword yet there? And then the last one is what are some areas of your life where you are actively growing? Who are you becoming? And it's, it's funny that I post these questions as a cue for you to actually have these conversations. But I hope that you're resonating with one or more of these questions so that you can you can share with other people. Not all of you need to share, by the way, but if you have some thoughts and things to share, please have a dialogue and see you back shortly. Hey, welcome back. So good to see your faces, you see. Ah, uh, pretty neat, eh? Hey, really, that's it. I just wanted to sort of get you to meet other people and also talk and at the same time, Really, thank you for being here in my very first publicly sharing of the book. I used to have this horrendous fear of writing for public, and I and I thought it will go away once you write a book, but it actually gets worse. So anyway, I am <laughs> terrified that people are actually reading, but I really hope that this is useful. So thank you so much for coming. And thank that's you. all. That's all. Thank you. <laughs> I just hey, so this will be all of you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Hassan. I just before people leave, I wanted to thank you everyone for joining. And also I put in the chat the link to our YouTube channel where we will post the recording of this dialogue and all of our previous dialogues are um, posted there as well. And also a very quick announcement that we have another type of dialogue we're very excited about. So after the education as relating uh, conference we had this past fall, we are now starting another free series of dialogues like this. Um, and the next one is March 1st at one o'clock Eastern time. So we invite everyone to join us there. Uh, but mostly thank you. Thank you so much, Hasan, for um, giving us this opportunity to talk about your book early and congratulations. And thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. But that's just the music. The words are simply, here comes Hey Son. <laughs>